Thank you, everyone. My name is Susan Harper. I'm the Consul General for Canada based in Miami, responsible for Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Our consulate is one of 14 offices across, Can across the United, State, re United States, which uh, represent Canadian interests, uh, including serving our respective business communities in areas of export promotion and investment attraction. And now, as uh, we're all aware, there have been some U.S. immigration rules which have changed in the last year, particularly for the granting of H-1B visas for specialized workers. And so uh, we have been in discussions with our network in the U.S., uh, thinking about how we can present some solutions to companies who are experiencing talent attraction challenges and how Canada can help in that regard. And today is part of a series of webinars that we are offering, which have been very well received across the United States. Thank you for joining me. And I have a, a couple of colleagues from our commercial section in uh, our Consulate General in Miami. We also have Invest Ottawa, which is the lead economic development agency for Canada's capital city. The commercial real estate leader, Crisa, representatives from Canada's Trade Commissioner Services and KPMG Law. And today's discussion is called Expanding Beyond Florida, the Canadian Immigration Advantage. Today, we're going to hear various stakeholders who can facilitate talent attraction, as well as from a renowned global manufacturing, uh, a global manufacturing services company here in Florida, JBIL, on their own strategies and challenges. I've also uh, been told that we have Hub International able to join us and we're very glad for that as well. Uh, we will be having Mary Claire LeMay who is also in our Consulate General in Miami um, from Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada. She'll be bringing years of experience to help guide us through the Go Global Skills Strategy Program and how that can benefit US companies looking for talent solutions in Canada. Well, essentially what we're doing today is answering the, Canada, the question, why Canada? Why could it make sense for your company to establish a presence up north? Obviously, I could cite several reasons, including, for example, the impact of faraway supply chain structures for essential goods, as we discovered during the early days of the COVID crisis. However, let me simply say that probably the number one issue for people looking to invest anywhere <laughs> refers to talent. Will you be able to have the talent you need for your business? And on that, two points. First, one of the key reasons for Canada's success in avoiding, in, a, 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 in attracting foreign investment is the level of education of its workforce with nearly 58% 58% of Canadians aged 25 to 64 having graduated from post-secondary institutions, Canada is the most educated workforce in the world. And two, if you can't find the specialized skills you need in homegrown talent in Canada, you can quickly bring in top international talent through the global skills strategy. With that introduction, I'm going to pass the mic to our presenters today starting with Invest Ottawa and Adam Dwar. Adam? Thank you, Susan. Um, Invest Ottawa is pleased to be part of this session today. Uh, the United States is obviously a major factor, a major uh, you know, source country for investment and trade for both the Ottawa region and Canada more broadly. Um, we started on this track and this journey after a discussion this summer with our, our partners at, at Cressa and Hub, where we decided that we should really get out there and work with the Canadian Consulate Generals who, who Invest Ottawa already had relationship with, relationships with rather, to um, really sort of build this sort of, this sort of business case out for companies that are 
um, in the region. Invest Ottawa has been a partner of the global skills strategy and the global talent stream under the memorandum of understanding with the Canadian government since the beginning of the pilot program. And it has been very successful for both our clients who are already here in the Ottawa region, our homegrown startups, and for those companies that we're working to attract into the region. It has been a major driver of investment decision because as you know, you rightly pointed out, Susan, talent is where it begins and ends. So, you know, the National Capital Region, we're happy to be, you know, an example of one of the great technology ecosystems going on in Canada, because Canada is having a technology renaissance right now, right across the board. Uh, we're seeing growth from coast to coast to coast. And, and in our case, we're happy to, to effectively be more or less in the middle of, of all of that that's going on right now. So we have about 80,000 people working in technology right now. Uh, one in nine of our population is a scientist and engineer. And as you rightly point out, in the case of Ottawa, two thirds have completed post-secondary education. So we're even above the Canadian average, um, primarily driven by our, our major employers, the tech sector and, and the federal government. So with that, nobody came here to listen to me talk. So we're going to move on to Martin Aus, our, our partner with Cressa. Um, and uh, he's going to give a few uh, words of overview and with, with uh, the, the immigration overview. Martin. Thanks, Adam. And, and I know nobody's here to hear about real estate either. So I'm going to make it really quick. I, I, I basically wanted to say, first of all, thank you. Uh, my, my name is Martin Ose. I'm, I'm with Cressa Canada, a real estate company that exclusively represents occupiers, uh, tenants, people that are looking for homes for their business. We felt it was a natural fit to help present this uh, because I trust there are people in the audience that are investigating Canada as a potential new home. So, um, you know, down the line, I hope to meet some of you and help uh, find some real estate options in Canada, hopefully even in Ottawa. But um, for, the, for now, I just want to thank you for coming and, and uh, get out of the way so you can hear about uh, the programs that can make it work for you. So thank you. All right, so I guess that is my turn now. So good afternoon, everyone. And uh, again, thank you for joining us today. My name is Marie-Claire Lemay. I'm the Migration Program Manager here at the Consulate General of Canada in Miami. As mentioned earlier, I work for IRCC, which is the Canadian Immigration Department. But I'm part of a wider network of officers. Uh, we're located in over 50 countries. Uh, and in the US, for instance, we have these offices in New York, in Los Angeles, and also in uh, Washington, DC. So as mentioned earlier, you know, when considering doing business in a new country, we understand that one of the most important aspects is as access to talent. And we think that Canada is giving you the possibility to easily access the talent that you need. I always think it's important to frame this as, as not so much necessarily about choosing Canada over another country, but really about considering Canada as part of your North American or, or even global strategy. My presentation uh, is going to be very condensed. I'm going to give you a little summary of some of the programs that could be of interest to you uh, in terms of immigration. I have already pasted a few links because it's a lot of uh, information to digest at the same time. And I will be posting also my, um, my email after my presentation in case you have further questions. So please free to contact me if you may have any, um, any questions afterwards. So to give you a bit of a background, Canada launched its global skills strategy back in 2017. So the intent at the time was to provide a more streamlined way to bring in top talent, you know, whether it's managers, uh, professionals, you know, or employees with uh, highly or specialized skills uh, or in-demand skills to Canada. And that strategy has four pillars. So the first pillar is we implemented work permit exemption for short-term work. So think about, let's say for example, you have a, a subject matter expert that you wanna bring into Canada just for a short time. You know, you just wanna set up a unit, you just wanna train a new unit for a short time, or you just wanna launch a project. Well, good news, you don't need a work permit for this. So save the red tape. Uh, if that uh, subject matter expert is gonna come to Canada for up to a maximum of 30 days in any 12 month rolling, uh, you don't need a work permit for that. So you already saved that time. We also implemented, uh, that's our second pillar, 
expedited work permit processing for top talent. So what I mean by that is that uh, in normal time, you know, with COVID, we're slightly affected, but in normal time, we can process certain work permit application in two weeks. So that's very fast. And actually for uh, people who are visa exam, I'm uh, for example, US citizens or US permanent residents, in some cases, they might even be able to apply at the port of entry, literally at the port of entry. So I don't think it can get any faster than this to get a work permit. A third pillar of our strategy is our dedicated service channel. So Companies making significant investment can be referred by one of our referral partners. So prime example, we have two here today. So Trade Commissioner Service, located in many of our uh, embassies and consulate overseas, and West Ottawa as well. So if you're referred, for example, by one of these partners or others uh, who are also listed in the link I will provide you, you could get access to a dedicated account manager from my department. So think about a concierge service for all your visa and immigration needs. So I think that's also a great thing. And the fourth pillar is our global talent stream. So for professional who may not qualify for a work permit under our um, international mobility program, which includes, for example, those who would be coming to work, uh, for example, under a free trade agreement or as intra-company transferee, et cetera, they may still benefit from expedited processing. Uh, there's two ways that can happen. So one is if their employer is referred by a designated partner, just gave you two examples just now, and they're hiring unique and specialized talent to come to work to, in Canada. Another way they can also qualify for that expedited processing in the global talent stream would be if they're highly skilled worker uh, who are coming to fill in-demand occupations on the global talent occupation list. So I will post the link because obviously there's a list of occupation, but if you have a worker, an employee who's working in IT, especially a lot of IT occupations are listed on that list. So there's a good chance they would qualify for that. So you might wanna check the list. So what happened in these cases? Well, we basically expedite what's called the labor market impact assessment. So LMIA process, which is like a document that employer needs to obtain to demonstrate that there's a need for that foreign worker to fill the job in Canada. So in normal time, we expedite it in, in 10 business days. But last time I checked, we were slightly behind. I think they were at 12 business days. So again, it's not it's still a reasonable time frame, I think. And, and after that, many may still qualify also for the expedited work permit processing, which again, in normal time would be around two weeks. Again, slightly delayed with COVID, but we're still looking at very reasonable time frame uh, for the time being. So that was a very quick overview uh, uh, about how Canada can perhaps help you facilitate uh, access uh, to international talent you know, in Canada. Um, but I know a lot of you will be wondering, you know, well, that's, that's all great, you know, but how do I find out what's the best available immigration option for my particular situation or my company or my client? So obviously the answer will depend on, 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 on the answer you would have to different questions. So, the first thing we need we would need to know is obviously does your business already have a parent a branch a subsidiary or an affiliate in Canada because to be able to bring a worker in Canada you need to have a foot you need to have a business doing business in Canada and it cannot be just a mailbox that a mailbox you set up with an agent it has to be a business doing business if you do not have that yet, I highly encourage you to contact our trade commissioner service and they can help you guide you through how you can set up, for example, a branch in Canada. Once you have uh, a foot in Canada business wise, then we can start looking at how you can, for example, move people to Canada. Depending on the citizenship of the particular employee or manager executive you're looking to move, you may have more or less options available to you. So, for example, if the employee is a citizen of a country with which Canada has a free trade agreement, you know, prime, prime example, U, uh, USMCA, you may be able to move uh, that employee under the International Mobility Program. And you may, able, may even be able to get the work permit literally at the port of entry, like I mentioned earlier. Whereas if you're dealing with a citizen from a visa required country with which Canada doesn't have any particular agreement, you may have to apply for a work permit ahead of time and you would likely require also an LMIA. So that just means it would take slightly more time. So you have to plan ahead. 
we need to look at what's the occupation of that employee. If it's an executive, a manager, or um, an employee with specialized knowledge, they could possibly qualify as intra-company trans transferee. That could be an option. If they're highly skilled, for example, in the IT sector, they may qualify for expedited processing under our uh, global talent stream that I mentioned earlier. And finally, another important aspect is, uh, is the move to Canada intended to be temporary or permanent. So if it's temporary, we're looking at work permit options. I mentioned a few already. And if we're looking at a, a more permanent move, then we might need to look at different programs in terms of permanent residence. But I think one thing I want to clarify, I think that's important to know, is that Canada doesn't have... Uh, an issue with the so-called dual intent. So if you have a worker going to Canada temporarily who wants to pursue permanent residence on the side at the same time, it's not a problem in terms of immigration. We don't have a problem with that. So what's the fastest way to get a worker to Canada? So you probably want to look at, is there a way that worker, manager, executive could fall under the international mobility program? Uh, because What's different with the regular work permit program for that particular program is that you're going to save a step because you're not going to need an LMIA. So obviously it's gonna be faster. So think about the Canadian equivalent of the US that the TN or E or L visa more or less. How can you qualify for that? There's two main ways. So one would be, for example, a citizen from a, a country which, with which Canada has a free trade agreement, like I said, USMC prime example. So for example, a citizen of the US or a citizen of Mexico in this case, who would be going to work in Canada as an intra-company transferee, a trader, an investor, or in one of the listed profession of the particular agreement. And USMC, we're talking, it's, it's the same list as we had under NAFTA. There's about 60 profession that are listed there. So that's one way. Another way would be if you're dealing with an intra-company transferee. And when I say intra-company transferee, it could be any nationality. There's no restriction in terms of citizenship there. Uh, but you need to uh, have been employed full-time for at least one year in the past three years to qualify. And you need to be going to work in a similar position at uh, an executive, senior manager, or um, in a specialized knowledge capacity in Canada. And obviously, you will need to be transferred at a parent, a subsidiary, a branch, or affiliate in Canada. So if you have that, basically, you could meet the criteria uh, for a work permit under the International Mobility Program. And the process for this is pretty straightforward. So the employer provides you, the employee, uh, a job offer. The, the Canadian employer would have to pay a compliance fee in the employer portal, which is all done online on our website. There is no need for LMIA. So basically, right after that, the worker can apply for the work permit either online if they have to apply ahead of time. Or in some cases, like I mentioned, US citizens, for example, they can literally apply at, uh, directly at the port of entry if they qualify. Now, if the employee does not qualify under the International Mobility Program, do not despair. There are still opportunities to get some sort of expedited processing in many cases. But then in the, in the other cases, you're going to be looking at the Temporary Foreign Worker Program, which is more the regular work permit process. So the key difference here with the process I just explained is that you're going to have an extra step and the employer in Canada will have to secure a positive LMIE, which is required with the application. But again, the good news is that if you qualify under the global talent stream, the LMIE process can be expedited. And you may also benefit again from expedited work permit processing. So again, it can still be fairly fast, even if you have to go through that extra step. Um, we know that a lot of workers, entrepreneurs, you know, uh, might also be interested in seeking permanent residence. So we've made it relatively easy for them to be able to bridge uh, towards permanent residence if they're interested in that. So I will mention maybe two programs that are maybe the more the most popular and especially for maybe this audience today. So one program that we have is the startup visa. So the startup visa program targets immigrant entrepreneurs uh, who, who, wants permanent, uh, who want to develop basically an innovative business ID uh, in Canada. And, but they need to obtain a letter of support from a designated organization. So 
Designated organizations for that purpose are listed on our website. Uh, they include venture capital funds, they include angel investor groups, and they also include business incubators. So as long as you have an innovative business ID and you get a letter of support of one of the listed organizations, you could qualify uh, for that visa and, and obtain permanent residence for you and your immediate family member. And one uh, very positive aspect of that program too is that while you wait for your permanent residence to be processed, you're eligible for a work permit. So that means basically you can already go to Canada with the work permit to get your business started as your permanent residence is getting processed on the side. Um, another popular option is Express Entry, which is our online system uh, that we use to manage uh, applications for permanent residence for a skilled worker. And when I say skilled worker, it could be of any type, not necessarily just IT workers. It's actually free to register uh, in that system as a candidate. And once you're in the pool of candidates, we score the candidates um, on, on what we call human capital factors. So we score them uh, based on their age, education, uh, work experience. Uh, um, official language abilities, etc. And basically, the highest score is considered the most likely to succeed economically in Canada. And every two weeks, we invite the top scorer from that pool uh, to present their permanent resident application. And once we receive the permanent resident application, our standard processing time is six months. And again, you can include your immediate family member in the application. So, on this, it's a lot of information. I was very happy to have provided you perhaps a little taste of information on some of the immigration programs that Canada can offer. I hope that it will have helped you perhaps uh, consider Canada as part of your wider uh, North, whether North American or global investment and talent strategy. I think our program make the visa and the immigration process easy with mostly online applications. Uh, we make it fast, you know, with expedited processing available in many cases. We also make it predictable, you know, we don't have caps based on things like nationality, citizenship, and we have a very high approval rate. Uh, when we look at global skill strategy, this is approval rate over 90%. So unless you have, you know, something out of the blue, a criminal record, something really uh, we didn't see coming, if you're qualified for the job and you have a valid job offer, there's very limited reason why we would, you know, refuse the work permit application. And also it's important for us to keep the families uh, together. So if a worker is approved a work permit, uh, we, uh, the, the um, accompanying spouse or common law partner and children are also entitled to their own work permit or study permit as well. Um, for those wishing to bridge towards permanent residence, again, I mentioned, for example, Express Entry, that makes it uh, fairly easy for those who want to pursue that route. And once you've become a permanent residence and you've resided in Canada for at least three years, you can become eligible for Canadian citizenship. So on this, if you have general questions, feel free to contact me in two seconds when I turn off my, uh, when I mute myself, I will put my email on the chat box. So feel free to email us if you have any questions and I'll be here also for the Q&A session. So thank you very much. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marie-Claire and Susan. Uh, very insightful and great uh, background for the next part of today's discussion. It's, it's going to be fairly interesting. We're going to do a fireside chat and you're going to hear the perspective of a Canadian company. Uh, we have Cyril McKelvey, who is actually going to speak from uh, J-Bill's Bill, perspective in terms of talent and strategy. I think it'll be very insightful. And uh, we've also got Hugh Doyle and we have Martin as well that are going to give a little bit of technical perspective about other factors you should think about when you're expanding or if you're growing your operation in Canada to give you some practical insight. I thought before we kick it off, I'd just give you a little perspective. Um, I, I represent KPMG Laws Immigration Practice in Canada. We have over 100 people and these issues are live to us every day. So companies are thinking differently about talent. They are thinking about how to support their North American operations and Canada is playing a key role. Um, two points I would make. We recently completed a, a survey from an executive perspective, and the number one issue on the radar of executives is talent. And that's important because typically executives were concerned about compliance, uh, disruption in the industry, and talent would kind of be at the bottom of the list. 
But COVID-19 has really changed things. You can't assume you can bring talent in. And we've seen many countries around the world have really become quite restrictive when it comes to immigration. And that's really challenged companies in being competitive globally. And let me just read one excerpt, which I think really captures the essence of this point. And this came from the, uh, the throne speech in Canada on immigration. Immigration remains a driver of Canada's economic growth. With other countries rejecting global talent that could help their economy, Cal Canada has an opportunity as we recover to become the world's top destination for talent, capital, and jobs. When people choose Canada, help build Canada, and make sacrifices in support of Canada, we should make it easier for them to formally become Canada, become Canadian. As part of both the short-term economic recovery and a long-term plan for growth, the government will leverage the advantage we have on immigration to keep Canada competitive on the world stage. And I think that's one of the key messages when you're thinking about talent, you have to think about the regions where you can actually access talent. And so uh, that's a nice segue. Uh, Cyril, we're so happy to have you join us today. Uh, you're a, a very uh, experienced executive leading operations in Canada, and you've had experience with multiple organizations. Perhaps you can start off with a little introduction about yourself, uh, your company in Canada, and the team. Sure, sure. Thank you, Newman. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, so my name is Cyril McKelvey. Uh, I'm a vice president with uh, J-Bill, j, -Bill, j -Bill Canada, uh, located in Ottawa. I've <laughs> been in the uh, Ottawa tech sector for the last 30 years or so which uh, really just means that I'm uh, getting old, I guess. Um, the, um, uh, just a comment on the, uh, the, uh, the opportunities that, uh, that this represents. So JVIL as a company has been in Ottawa since um, 2015. JVIL is a, a tier one EMS provider, contract manufacturer. Company does approximately 27 billion in revenue, uh, headquartered in uh, St. Pete's, Florida, uh, 200, some odd thousand employees around the world, uh, 100 plants in 29 countries. Uh, Ottawa is a, um, a new location from a JVIL perspective, it was opened up in 2015. Uh, I was the uh, second employee in the office. Uh, today we have approximately 50 people. Our team is uh, overweighted to uh, engineering uh, type talent. So we have software people, uh, uh, optical engineers, hardware designers, uh, 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 RF simulation people, etc. So the majority of our uh, resources are uh, engineers, PhD type uh, individuals. Uh, the the uh, activity that was described a bit earlier by uh, Marie Leclaire, sorry Marie Claire and uh, and uh, Susan uh, has been important to us from the perspective of being able to get access to that talent. So. What I mean by that is growing the company from two people to 50 people. Uh, we've, we've accessed a number of uh, the programs with the government of Canada to, uh, to bring people into the country using the, like the LMI, LMIA process. Um, we've attracted talent from India, from uh, China, from Iran, um, because these are the kinds of resources that we require and it's uh, difficult to find all those resources uh, lo locally. Uh, at the same time, uh, and our experience has been, um, and just to go to uh, Marie Claire's comment, uh, our experience has been, we've been able to work through these programs specifically with the LMIA and attract people in, uh, in a time frame of approximately five to six weeks. So that's from the time that we've identified the candidate to the time that they walk through the door and we give them a badge, which to me is pretty remarkable considering they're coming from, uh, you know, as I say, China, Iran, uh, et cetera. The other comment I'll make very quickly um, is that within j of course, we're a global company, uh, considering the uh, activities and some of the challenges right now with uh, work visas, uh, specifically in the US, uh, we've had a number of, uh, uh, people come to the Ottawa location who have work visas in the US, have come from, let's say, China or India, uh, and their work visas are uh, coming to an end, and they are concerned about whether they can actually renew them or not. So we have at least three or four people in our office who have moved from uh, JBO locations in San Jose or Michigan or, or St. Pete's to our Ottawa office. Uh, 
Uh, they continue to work for those business units because we're a global company, of course, uh, but they are working out of the Ottawa location. And again, that process uh, was, was uh, very easy to execute on in terms of getting them relocated to, uh, to Canada. Great, Cyril, thanks so much for that perspective. I mean, hearing that on the ground and understanding you were like employee number one at one point, and you've seen the growth of up to 50 people in many different occupations. I think that really sort of paints the, uh, the case that having a talent strategy to execute in terms of what you wanna do on the ground in terms of your business strategy is critical. And um, the point you just made on strategic leverage of you know, Canadian operations to help your US operations is in, in fact very popular. And I'll give you a couple different perspectives, what we've seen, and some of these points may resonate, right. uh, not only with what you're currently doing, but what you see on the ground in Ottawa and elsewhere. A lot of companies are now thinking, um, perhaps it makes sense to think of Canada and the US as one North American region. And in some instances, talent is actually being deployed first in Canada it, it, because of the predictability that you mentioned. And uh, without, you know, going into too much detail about other uh, programs, you know, Canada doesn't have a quota in terms of its right. work permit accessibility and the timelines you've mentioned when you're talking about four or five weeks. Um, if you're subject to a lottery, there's no guarantee over the course of a year you'll even be approved and so that can be a real game changer. Um, and then I've also seen the point that you've made where in some instances, if you've got great talent in North America and they have to leave. Uh, from down south, it may make sense where feasible, if there is a suitable position in Canada, to transfer those individuals um, to Canada. And Marie Claire nicely described the intracompany transfer for individuals who have been working in the US for more than a year with an organization and they have a related operation in Canada. That can be a, a very effective uh, process to really keep talent in North America. So I think your insight uh, is, is very useful. And for those who are listening, I'm sure if you have questions about practically on the ground from a company perspective, what immigration means to a business in Canada, uh, your insights would be uh, very valuable as well. Any general comments you would uh, provide for companies who find in the US that they're not able to meet their sufficient demand of talent? Uh, where do you see the value of Canada in a North American model? Yeah, so, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to focus uh, on the Ottawa region because that's where I'm located, but I know the same comments apply to Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, Calgary, Halifax. Um, you know, the, uh, within the Ottawa region, um, we have uh, a number of universities and community colleges. So from a, a J-Bill perspective, uh, and we have other, uh, you know, partner companies here, people like Siena and Nokia and other uh, large uh, uh, tier one OEMs, uh, you know, we, we depend a lot on the local uh, uh, universities uh, for, the, for that talent. Um, so, you know, we're not, not of the 50 people that we have here, probably 80% of them are, I'm gonna call them local, like in other words, graduates from our universities. Um, the second thing is that uh, certainly from a, a recent experience perspective as it relates specifically to COVID, um, you know, the, the reality is that more and more of those uh, resources are finding their, you know, that they're working from home, or, or in this case, maybe they're working remotely, whatever that definition is. And, uh, you know, the result of that, of course, is that you can have a software developer uh, located in Canada, working with a software developer located in, uh, in uh, Wuxi, China, or, or in, uh, in India, and, and, you know, jointly developing a product. And, um, you know, I think that that's, that the situation we've gone through recently has really just highlighted that. So really at the end of the day, if you're looking for talented people, uh, and, you know, in our case, we feel that Ottawa is a good location for specifically certain skill sets. Uh, the fact that you can have those resources in Ottawa working for your company that's headquartered in St. Pete's, Florida and interfacing with engineers in Penang or Singapore or Nuremberg, Germany, uh, you know, that, that to me, says that you should really go where the talent is. And in this case, you know, we've got the capability here, number one, from the university point of view, but number two, given the relationship and the, the initiatives with the Canadian government, we find it easy to bring people from other parts of the world, which I think is a great advantage. I'm really glad you raised that point because remote work combined with accessibility of immigration 
has changed the equation of, of how you execute a business yeah. strategy across borders. And, and I've seen that too, where it, it may be a company, whether it's global or in the US, and they've decided because of time zones, proximity, perhaps having a, a talent hub for your business in Canada may make sense. And, and if you align it within the right uh, time zones, um, there can be benefits in terms sure. of serving clients. And um, interestingly, too, some of these companies have been very surprised to see the types of tax credits, particularly with innovation and, and R&D work that they can get. Right. So, you know, there's a, a value proposition there that's fairly compelling when executed properly. So I think uh, that's a really good point strategically. And uh, perhaps maybe uh, this is a nice segue, uh, Hugh and Martin. I mean, obviously, when companies are coming into Canada, they have to think holistically. The talent is definitely a key driver, um, but maybe, maybe Hugh, you can kick it off in terms of like, what are the benefits considerations that you know, an individual should think about as opposed to what they're used to in the US? What should they expect in Canada? Yeah, thanks, Noan. So uh, yeah, just to give a, a bit of context, uh, Hugh Doyle, I'm a Vice President of Employee Benefits and Group Retirement here at Hub. So we often deal with, uh, with companies locating here through an invest auto and other sources. Um, I think one of the one of the shockers for US companies in particular when they locate to Canada is the cost of things like healthcare and employee benefits because Canada has um, you know relatively speaking a universal healthcare program. So a lot of items are covered here in Canada by provincial programs that are not covered in the US they tend to be pretty shocked at how cheap things like benefits are in, in Canada. So that's definitely a plus factor. Um, I think it's always a shock actually to US companies how much that costs them in the US um, compared to what it costs them in, in, in Canada. Um, and then I think some, some other factors play into part as well. Often with tech firms, um, when you're talking about just compensation, um, compensation is one aspect. So they end up paying often their their employees in Canadian dollars, but they're still billing their clients in US dollars as well. Seems very simplistic, but in reality, it's quite a large benefit, right? So, so I, I would touch on those two things, yeah. Great, great, thanks for that perspective. Uh, Martin, what would your insight be if you were a company abroad and you were thinking about those commercial uh, real estate issues or site location in Ottawa? What are, uh, what's the analysis you provide? Um, it's, it's, uh, in, in the case of commercial real estate, it's, uh, we're more similar than different, uh, when, when you look at uh, how things operate at south of the border, uh, in Canada, it's, it's, you know, the benefit that Hugh was speaking about, which is really, a, it's a dollar, uh, value benefit. It's real estate's probably, uh, two thirds, two thirds, the cost that it is in the States, but otherwise it's the same process. It's the same sort of requirement uh, for, for legal involvement, the same negotiation exercise. It's very, very comfortable for U.S. Mm -hmm. companies to come here and structure a real estate deal because it's pretty much the same thing, but cheaper. <laughs> right. And, and with uh, the impact of COVID, what do those opportunities look like now? I imagine uh, there are probably some pretty prime opportunities. Uh, yeah, there are certainly opportunities in some markets, for sure. There's a lot of change happening. Uh, I mean, this, that, that's, a, that's a, another two-hour phone call, but uh, <laughs> they're, they're really, the, it's still getting sorted out as well. I mean, how companies are dealing with uh, workplace strategies uh, thanks to COVID, it's, it's really still shaping up. Um, but work from home and uh, strategies that came out of COVID are really what we think are going to become a permanent feature of workplace in Canada. Right. But I, I think, again, that's probably not that different than what people are experiencing south of the border. So I think my overarching thing is it's, it's, uh, it's pretty similar across the board, real estate and, and workplace considerations. Great. Yeah. And I can tell you from experience in dealing with companies that are relocating, you know, obviously they, they need to consider where they want to base themselves. Remote work has sort of shifted that paradigm a little bit, but there are a lot of logistical steps that need to be coordinated that make a successful move. So that's definitely something to keep on your radar. Um, no, the one thing, uh, Naman, I would, I would add to my earlier comments and your comments is it, I, I think there are different markets in different parts of Canada feature different skill sets. 
Right. But what Ottawa has, and it's a technology, it's a technology market in a lot of ways, but there are some very significant talent pools in other parts of Canada that, you know, FinTech, for instance, is in Toronto, but, but that's that, uh, the, the reality is there are uh, certain markets, certain real estate section sectors that are going to be better for certain industries. Right. Yeah, I, I think that's a really valid point. And companies tend to, uh, when they're thinking of talent, it's not only the foreign accessibility of talent, but that local pool as well. That's critical. And uh, if you can structure your location in a way where you have access to both, then typically that's sort of a sustainable strategy going forward. So I, I would echo those comments. Um, coming back to Cyril, uh, what other, you know, you've had such experience with different companies, you've seen a lot of different uh, approaches. What are some of the other benefits you typically find in operating in Canada? And I'll kind of uh, throw a lead out there. You know, what's really critical is that employees, if, if they're coming into a new country that, you know, they feel comfortable where they're, they're being based. Generally, what's your feeling about doing business in Canada over the years and from your experience? Yeah, so um, again, I'll focus on uh, on Ottawa, but I think that uh, you know these comments can apply to other parts of the country. Of course, um, you know a lot of people uh, uh, that, uh, especially people that come from outside the country, uh, you know, come to a place like Ottawa, and and you know the the, um, the the standard of living from a family perspective, you know, the the fact that uh, you know Canada has a population of 35 million people and one of the largest land masses in the world, um, you know, you get a lot of, uh, a lot of benefits for that. And, um, you know, at the same time, uh, especially Ottawa, you know, being the nation's capital, uh, you know, there's a, um, an infrastructure here that, uh, that comes with that, uh, albeit that it's still, you know, only a city of approximately a million people. Um, but I think that the, um, you know, the kind of work-life balance is a, is a very positive thing. Um, as you, you commented a bit earlier, uh, Newman, on, in, alluded to anyway, the uh, R&D uh, innovation environment. So from a, a Canada perspective, uh, what we refer to as SR&ED tax credits, uh, you know, is an environment where companies are encouraged to spend money on R&D and innovation, and then the government provides them up to, I think it's something in the range of 60 cent dollars uh, against that, uh, that spend. Uh, so people are encouraged to, you know, to, to, to hire those kinds of resources that are going to innovate for you as a company. And, and that's been a real advantage for um, especially, uh, you know, smaller companies uh, in, in terms of uh, startups and those kinds of things. Um, you know, so I think that that, you know, that whole kind of taxation environment from an innovation perspective is a very positive environment here too. Great. And, and maybe to give a little context um, from what I'm seeing on the immigration side, a lot of companies, whether they're, you know, startups or they're looking to expand into Canada, what they end up being quite surprised at when we have a deeper discussion is that often they're eligible for three different types of permits that could allow them entry into Canada. Perhaps they're eligible for a startup visa. Um, they could be expanding an existing business through an intra-company transfer. And then there's a global talent stream that also allows unique talent to get work permits. Um, and so I think unlike other countries, sometimes these same companies don't have the avenue or the predictability. So that's one benefit. And then, you know, your points about the corporate tax structure and the incentives is helpful. The other piece that sometimes goes missing here is the experience of the assignee. You know, if a foreign national is going to transfer to another country with their family. Given what we've seen you know, globally on immigration and, and some of the challenges that we've seen, it's really important for them to feel, first, I'm gonna be safe and, and secure wherever I am, but that I can transition my status and remain in the country as a permanent resident, um, just to know that they can secure their rights. And we saw with COVID, you know, individuals who were not permanent residents or citizens, if they're outside of the country, is quite difficult to even get back, right? And so I think that experience is really important. And just to tie it back to this concept of, uh, you know, thinking larger in North American strategies, we've even seen some companies who have said, you know, our strategy is to bring in the best talent into Canada. 
and actually support them to get permanent residence in Canada. But down the road between Canada and the US, if we need to shift resources, we can assign our workers back to the US if there's a need. And it, what's quite interesting in Canadian immigration law is a permanent resident in Canada on an assignment to the US is deemed to be uh, in Canada for the purpose of maintaining their permanent residency status. So theoretically, you could have permanent residents in Canada right. who are taking an assignment to the US while they maintain their status in Canada. And then at the end of their assignment, they can return. And what I've found from my experience is, you know, a lot of assignees want the, um, the total experience. They want to make sure their families are, uh, you know, secured. They might want that amazing US experience. And then perhaps they might want to end up back in Canada. So I think one of the points here is, really reimagining talent and thinking about, you know, this new world that we, we, we have, which has got some advantages and flexibility now with the way remote work has, uh, has turned up. So I think um, I'm just going to ask my co-panelists if they had any further closing statements. I think we've um, been able to run through most of the agenda issues. Um, Cyril, any, any closing comments? Um, maybe just a couple comments. Um, so, you know, I referred a bit earlier to the, you know, the benefits that J-Bill has been able to, to get out of the, uh, the you know, the, what I think is a very progressive approach that the Canadian government's taking around immigration. Um, you know, my, my description there applies to a lot of other companies. So, you know, within the Ottawa region specifically, there are some companies that have located here from places like Sweden, a uh, company called Centronics that started here maybe five years ago with uh, like maybe five employees and now they're over a hundred. Uh, and then, you know, they've taken advantage of, of all the things that we've talked about. Um, the other comment I'll make really quickly is that, you know, the, the whole dynamic around the, uh, the, you know, the tech sector specifically, uh, which is where a lot of these um, uh, skill sets are find their way. Uh, is really, um, you know, growing rapidly in, in, in Canada, whether it's in the Waterloo region or Toronto or Vancouver or Halifax, et cetera. So part of what I'm saying there is that those companies, people like Shopify and others, ha have taken full advantage of, uh, of this, uh, of this uh, opportunity. And the result of that has been that there's pretty dramatic growth that's being seen uh, you know, whether it's uh, reduce, reduce unemployment or, or, you know, GDP, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the, the, the benefits that associated with that have been pretty dramatic in the last three to five years, I would say. That's a great point. And um, you, you mentioned Shopify. And uh, for those of you who are interested in learning about their evolution, um, on my LinkedIn is a video with myself and the, the global mobility leader of Shopify, which it really talks about where they were before the global talent stream came into play. And like many companies, it was taking four or five or six months to recruit, find the talent by the time they filed the work permit and Marie Claire looked at it, they had already moved to Australia, right? And so this was the time where the Canadian government came together with stakeholders and they said, how can we develop a, a better system? So companies like a Shopify could be headquartered in Canada, but compete internationally. And that gave birth to the global talent stream. And, and I really, I'm really impressed with the design of this program. Um, in short, you as a Canadian employer make a commitment to the government to train Canadians, to grow revenues, potentially hire uh, new roles for Canadians. And in exchange for that commitment, you don't have to recruit for uh, positions, but you're allowed to then apply for work permits on an expedited basis. And the government will revisit to see whether or not you met your commitments. So when all goes well, it's a win-win because you get potentially uh, university students who are being trained by experts in leading corporations. You're getting the talent that you need to come in and amplify your business. And because Canada has become quite strategic on the talent front, you know, I'm seeing in my own practice, you know, every week, another company saying, hey, we're really thinking about the Canadian uh, advantage here of having uh, an operation and growing. And I think when you've got these programs and you've got good corporate players all really investing together, that's when you have a successful program. And I, I think that's what we've seen. And uh, many companies are looking to, to partake in it. So 
Um, Cyril, I just want to thank you, first of all. I mean, what I found in these sessions is hearing from people who've actually been in the trenches on the ground is probably the most valuable experience that uh, anyone in the audience can benefit from. And uh, Martin Hugh, also understanding those other factors and your resource and your skills, I think is very useful as well for those uh, on the line who might have questions. So thank you all for participating in the, uh, in the session today. Thank Naman, you. I have, I have one question I wanna ask of, sure. of other panelists. Um, is Canada an easy sell? Do people, do potential employees looking at potentially moving to Canada, do they look at that as a, as a really good thing, as kind of uh, second to going to, I don't know, the US or Australia? Like, how do we, how do we stack up? Uh, Martin, I could probably answer that one because I, I, I located here from Ireland uh, about <laughs> seven or eight years ago. <laughs> And I think when it comes to immigration, I would say, uh, just answer that from my own experience, not an expert. Uh, I think Canada stacks up really well. I, I mean, if you come here through the LMIA program, there's a very clear path to residency. Um, so you can, you can really be quite certain of your future. So when I was choosing between US and Canada, mainly in Australia, actually was one of the others. That was a large part of why I chose Canada. Um, lifestyle, but also just knowing the immigration policy and, and how straightforward that was, I, I found that a, a really appealing factor. I would, uh, I would just add on that I, I hear the same feedback and I think individuals have observed as well the experience with COVID, um, the way that it's been handled in Canada, that's had quite a bit of impact. The ability to know that your spouse or common law partner can work immediately, you can't underestimate that. That's a very uh, compelling, particularly if you're looking at a, a country where you can't do that. That's uh, a challenging issue. And I think really that transition to permanent residence, to know that there is a merit-based system and you're not waiting for five, six, or seven years, um, you can't underestimate the value of that too from an immigration perspective. So we've seen quite a bit of enthusiasm and really cl clients come already kind of halfway convinced. They just want to understand more the technical and, and how to make sure that their business hits the ground running. Uh, great question though, I think to kind of wind up the panel. Um, if there aren't any further comments, maybe I'll turn it back to Adam and just kind of uh, summarize. Yes, so, so once again, we want to thank everybody for joining us today. We want to thank uh, you know all of our partners from the Canadian consulate to our investor partners like Cyril McKelvey to uh, you know Mary Claire at, at Immigration Citizenship and Refugees, Martin Ouse, Hugh Doyle, um, the Hub team, the Cressa team, uh, and my team, Susan Harper, our head of mission uh, representing Canada very well in, in Miami, and, and Nolman from KPMG for for your work today and moderating the panel. And if I've forgotten anybody, I'm sorry, I that's not my intention. Uh, trying to remember everybody um, but anyway in in terms of next steps if anybody should like to have a discussion with us any of the panelists um, you know we've been sharing LinkedIn and various contact details in the chat um, people can feel free to call me or use one of the booking links also put forward in the chat uh, at any particular point and I'm happy to triage things in in any direction I also noted that Mary Claire has shared her contact information in the in the chat as well. So, you know, please feel free to reach out. Please feel free to use us all as resources. And if you're watching this in the future, uh, you know where to find us. Thank you very much. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.